Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, Gary, you have some slides? Just slides for the beginning. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. We'll let everyone get into the webinar and get started in just a couple of minutes. Good morning, everyone. My name is Garrett Sheehan. I'm president and CEO of the Greater New Haven Chamber of Commerce. We appreciate you joining us for our webinar today, Restructuring Your Physical Workspace with Safety and New Guidelines in Mind. Obviously, the reopen has begun, started back on May 20th. It's a slow process, we know, uh, and many people are having to change the way their physical space is set up to be able to conform to the guidelines that were issued from the state and just to keep safety for both your customers and employees. We have a great panel that will go through several of these topics this morning, so we look forward to getting into that. Um, before we get started, I do want to thank our sponsor uh, this morning, Munger Construction. Pat Munger Construction has continued to provide quality general construction services throughout the pandemic while adhering to all safety standards. And in addition to those services, Munger has also helped customers with plexiglass barriers, partitions, hands-free fixtures and doors and other necessary services to help those businesses reopen and bring their employees back to work safely. Uh, and Pat Munger Construction has been a, a great partner of the chamber for many years. And so we appreciate them being involved with us in presenting this webinar this morning. Also want to thank all of our streaming partners. We work with many chambers of commerce across the region and they stream our webinars live. And so the Madison Chamber of Commerce, Bridgeport Regional Business Council, Milford Regional Chamber of Commerce and the Central Connecticut Chambers of Commerce. And of course the Quinnipiac Chamber of Commerce. We have only been able to continue operating because of the support of all of our investors. So our premier investors, key investors, and then also all of our principal investor businesses uh, and organizations. Um, we really appreciate the support that we continue to receive from the business community that allows us to put on programming like this. So our format for today, if you've attended our webinars in the past, it's fairly similar. We're gonna go through each of our panelists, ask them uh, to speak for a couple of moments, and then we're gonna open it up to your questions Feel free to start populating those questions into the chat and we'll get through them as best we can. Uh, as I said, we have a great lineup with us this morning and I'm gonna lead off with Mark Nisbet. He is the president and CEO of People, Places and Spaces. You may have seen Mark at our real estate forum uh, back a couple of years ago when he was our keynote speaker. So Mark, thanks for joining us. Uh, we're glad to have you in the chamber. And, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing and, and how you guys are working through this pandemic? Sure, sure. And uh, thank you very much, Gary. Really honored to be a part of this session with uh, a group of great panelists. So thanks so much. And I, I, I want to say, as we know, this, this has been uh, uncertain times and difficult uh, situations that we're going through. And we're making strong attempts to navigate uh, through it. And uh, it's gonna be tough and, and it's gonna take some time. But I would say, uh, you know, when you look at what the CDC guidelines have put in place that created the framework for how we're gonna handle uh, the situation and how we operate uh, in our workplace and what the experiences would be like, it's gonna be interesting because, you know, there's gonna be in uh, the next 60 days and then we're gonna continue to evolve for the next 120 days and then uh, for the next year. And during those times as corporations and companies and people make the adjustment, uh, you know, the companies are gonna be measuring the behavior of the employees and then they'll be adjusting accordingly. And we'll also be learning along the way. So I think as we continue to learn yeah. how to navigate and mitigate the situation that we have, we can help put everyone in a better place and safe environment and uh, help our corporations achieve the goals that they need to do for their employees. 
Thanks, Mark. And we'll get back to you in just a moment. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Michael Schaefer with CA White. And Michael has several buildings across the region, uh, even across multiple states. And so, uh, Michael, you've seen a, a great cross section of how businesses have had to respond to everything that's going on. And obviously, you guys have had to do a lot as well. Yeah, it, you know, I, I echo what Mark is saying that, you know, there, there's a lot of experimentation going on. We're learning as we go. I, I think we're all gaining some new skills, interestingly enough. Uh, obviously, remote uh, activities, um, whether it's Zoom, whether it's meetings, whether it's communication, uh, whether it's even information sharing. Uh, so this has been uh, a time that our skill sets have been challenged, but we've also learned some new skills um, and, and have been very helpful, not only for now, but for the future. But, you know, what I think about is that Historically, we've been concerned about really two things with our tenants. One is comfort and one is safety and the other is safety. Now we're thinking about health and well-being. So we've had to change the dynamic of our relationship with our tenants in ways that recognize we've got to also be careful and concerned about you know, the environment and whether they're healthy and safe in those environments as well as comfort. Uh, and that's been a huge change. The other thing has been, um, you know, it's a participatory process where historically the relationship with tenants was you pay rent and you call when you have problems and we fix them. Now it's a question of how do we work together to ensure the safety and well being of our tenants, of their employees, and of guests that come in. And these are things that, you know, we historically didn't do and they didn't do. And it's so it's created a we have uh, identified a point person with every tenant that we have, and we have multiple tenants over, you know, two states. Um, and so we coordinate with them, we communicate with them, and hopefully it's a way that we can ensure that there's a greater sense of care and, com uh, and concern and well-being and that people will feel safe in the environment. Clearly, we've done things about using plexiglass barriers, all of our employees have masks, all of our employees have, uh, uh, have gloves. We have increased the amount of air intake and, uh, and uh, changing of filters and uh, in, in, in HVAC systems. We've cleaned those out. Um, obviously high touch uh, surfaces and bathrooms are, are, are receiving much greater care than they've done in the past. But the reality is, is we don't control what goes on in the spaces themselves. And that's why this need for uh, interaction between ourselves and the tenants and, and in terms of communications. And, and that's been an invaluable piece of this process that we put in place. I, I think, you know, right now we're dealing with tactical changes, operational changes, structural changes in the way that, uh, you know, offices in the future will look like. It's hard to, to tell at this point. You know, time will tell, as Mark says, we're gonna learn as we go. Clearly, we've been through 102 years ago a pandemic and, and business turned back to normal once we got through the pandemic. I mean, I, you know, so it's hard to know how much this is going to change the way people operate. I do think there have been issues of late as in the last 15, 20 years, uh, the, the number of individuals in, in spaces has increased the Square footage per employee has been reduced for a variety of reasons. Uh, and I know that, you know, we deal with WeWorks in New York. Uh, you know, some of this has been problematic. Uh, it, you know, employees do need some space. Uh, they do need uh, opportunities to get away from each other. They also need to interact. Um, and so, you know, the future is still up in the air. And clearly we've also learned how to operate remotely. So there's a lot that has changed, and, but there's still a lot that will stay the same. And so uh, I have a sense of where we are now. I, I, I have a good sense of what the intermediate is gonna be. I'm not sure entirely what the future is gonna hold, but you know, obviously we think about that an awful lot at the moment. Great, thank you, Mike. And uh, we'll be back to you in a moment. Uh, now I want to introduce Don Tofomandi, Senior Vice President of Strategic Accounts and Client Services at Red Thread. And Don, thank you so much for joining us. And I know you uh, spend a lot of time thinking about these issues over the last couple of months. 
Uh, night and day, um, and I apologize, we have uh, we had some audio issues, so I'm hoping everybody can hear me okay. Um, and I'm really honored to be a part of this group, and I, and I kind of chuckled to myself and thought, wow, a, a panel of experts around something that we're all learning so much about. So I guess if we're all expert, I think we're all expert in learning right now. Um, and learning from each other is so critically important. Um, and, and really listening to what Mark and, and Michael were talking about, um, I totally agree with a lot of your sentiments. It's such a complex and dynamic time for us, um, whether it's in the workplace, healthcare, higher education, um, all of these spaces are going to have to be reconsidered. And it is very hard to anticipate what that far view is. Um, so, you know, we kind of bucket it in, um, in a term of now, near, and far so that we can really focus on what do we need to do now to keep people productive? Um, you know, people talk a lot about the new normal. I don't think any of us know what the new normal is going to be. It's, it's, you know, we're in the now normal now where, as Michael said, we're learning new technologies, ways to connect, ways to keep things moving forward. And in order to figure out what's next, next, we really have to be very thoughtful about how we go about that. Um, companies are going to still want their people to be together in some way, shape, or form. But as Michael, you were pointing out, this open environment that we've all been working towards with a lot of um, you know, customers and organizations over the last several years has provided a great benefit in their competitiveness and their agility and, and the ways in which they can collaborate and connect but it doesn't support what we're going through now. So how do you adapt those environments in a way where you can not make a crazy amount of investment, but you could still support reboarding a fair amount of employees? So those are a lot of the things that we're talking about. And it really, if you think about that, the current environment, it really is an ecosystem of spaces and that's what it'll need to be going forward, but there'll be different types of spaces. Um, and I think the point that several, um, of us have made around the well-being component is very important as well. Um, we really need to think about the physical well-being and safety of people, but also their emotional and cognitive well-being. Um, you know, and that's you know going to be something that's paramount to organizations in order to maintain their their future focus and what they need to do. <clears throat> Technology is going to play a huge role in that as well. Um, as that, I think that ecosystem of spaces is going to include a large work from home component for at least a fair amount of the, the future. Um, and, and in some aspects, probably, um, a, you know, a good amount of the long term planning for companies um, as they try to reduce density um, and, you know, are able to be able to provide that distancing and those tools that people need to work in the office and to connect with people that are continuing to work remotely. Great. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. And thanks for joining us. We'll be back with you in just a moment. Um, and now I want to introduce our, our final panelist, Karen Patrickwin with Patrickwin Architects. And uh, Karen, thanks for joining us. I know you, you've even uh, worked on different design layouts um, for many different types of customers, whether it's restaurants to office space. So thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Garrett, for all of that you do with the Chamber. Uh, your webinars have really been a lifeline uh, since uh, March that third week in March. Um, so thank you very much, very honored to be here. Um, yes, we have been doing some um, uh, diagrams of how to look at the uh, guidelines that have been uh, sent out in the state of Connecticut. And I'm sorry, I just need to uh, share my screen, which I will do here. Um, and I would like to share just our two case studies um, that we have done around uh, office spaces. So one second, bear with me, I'm sorry. There we go. So the first is looking at, we're just looking at two different uh, office layouts. Uh, one that is very large, one that is quite a bit smaller, because I think that it helps um, look at some of the issues that we think about when we think about returning to work um, and what does, what does that do to the actual space. So we're looking again at the very short term, how do we create an environment at this point with the guidelines that we know at this point, which is a 50% uh, reduction in employees. So this is a product that we worked on last year for a very large uh, office plate, uh, two tenants on one floor. So this is the current layout that they have. It's a number of um, workstations in a central space and um, uh, a ribbon of offices 
uh, along the windows, along the other two window uh, bays, and uh, uh, conference rooms of various uh, sizes. So this particular floor um, had 98 employees or a capacity of 98 employees. The first thing that we recommend is to really look at how you enter the space, how you exit the space. Is it possible to make those separate? So in this case, what we're doing is we're creating a circulation that encourages a one-way circulation so that you're not passing too many people in corridors. In this type of environment where there's quite a bit of density, that just really helps. Um, so you can see in this case, we're creating, I don't know if you, can you see my mouse as well? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So uh, as you enter the space right here, uh, you're coming down. The first thing that we do is we recommend here in this case, let's remove these workstations entirely so that we can really have an overall circulation. So on your entry and exit uh, for the day, when they're probably the most sort of movement, take those. You know, in the middle of the day, you can sort of move around a little bit. Uh, but in this case, where, where they're probably working uh, more regular hours, uh, let's create a circulation path that is generally one way. So we remove these, uh, these workstations here to, in order to create that circulation path. Those paths can be either, you know, signs, they can be stickers on the floor, they can be any number of things. Uh, but so signage really is a, uh, an important component if this is, uh, if we are returning. Uh, the next thing is to look at how to reduce the number of employees, in this case from 98 to 49. So in this case, we're taking some from the workstations, taking some from the offices as well. Um, and this can be looked at in a couple of ways. You know, is this sort of slowly coming in or is this that you have sort of a group A, group B where you have half of the workforce working for a certain amount of time and half another time. That's really up to the, to the group. But we just wanted to look at one scenario of what this looks like when we're reducing by 50%. We also know that in conference rooms, you, we want to reduce even further so we don't have too many people in an enclosed space. In large conference rooms, you may even want to make that a one-way circulation. Um, if you do have to have a meeting of a certain number of people. Uh, in, uh, adding barriers, whether it's plexiglass or any of those other barriers that we've seen around, um, either suspended from the ceiling or attached to a workstation, uh, in order to create a safe distance from the person working at that workstation. And finally, just uh, creating washing or um, sanitizing areas that are visible so that people are just re really encouraged to use them. And the touchless are obviously the, the better option. Um, and that's sort of your day one, sort of just, just on the physical side. Obviously there are much many more other considerations like um, you know, encouraging video conferencing still as we go forward, um, creating little rooms so that people can have these conversations or have these video conferences with their clients as we move forward. Um, so that's one case study. This is actually our own office uh, here in New Haven, um, corner of Front and Grand. And we are a small office on two floors. So in this case, we, have, we don't have an elevator, but we have two, um, two uh, stairs. We have three tenants. So if we wanted to, we could create an in and an out. So this could be an upstair. This could be the downstair. Um, in our case, you know, our, our parking lot's over here, so it just means that when people are leaving, they would just go around the block, which is probably not a bad thing. Um, and the first thing we do is we encourage, uh, again, a one-way circulation. And in this case, we chose a circulation path because we want to encourage people using the sink first when they, when they first come in to wash their hands. We reduce the capacity from 14 employees to seven employees and increased and then decreased even further in the conference rooms to make sure there are never more than uh, five people. Putting barriers uh, where necessary. In our case, we have very low ceilings on the second floor. We, we might be hanging them from the ceiling or we'll attach them to the desks. And then finally, just showing where we we're probably gonna put um, sanitizers. Uh, probably sanitize at everyone's desk, but then maybe uh, some sanitizers um, for everyone to use. So that's it for me. Great. <clears throat> no, it's uh, very helpful to be able to see that. You know, Karen, maybe I'll start with you because you know, we're talking about office spaces and other types of uh, locations as well. And I think seeing your office was, was good because it's not just the large kind of floor at a, at a large building. But what type of advice would you have for a restaurant or a retail store? And again, those are going to be really unique spaces 
Um, yeah, yeah. So we've looked at restaurant. We didn't want to publish the ones that are for interior restaurants as yet because there are no guidelines for those. But we took a, a look at what would that would what would that look like at fifty percent. And again, it's the same same concepts. The one way circulation, having people come in one door. Uh, if there's pickup, it's a different pickup area and no cross between uh, queuing. In that case, is going to be important. So queuing on the sidewalk, um, and then trying to create an exit that's separate if possible. So same concept, so that one-way circulation, knowing that, and then encouraging um, staff to use that same circulation as much as possible. We know there's gonna be a little more in and out, but if they see someone walking in one direction, stay with that same direction. Uh, obviously in restaurant, the transactions are really important, the, the credit cards. And in that case also, the when people take off their masks is really important. Um, so those are the same kind of concepts and then each, each industry will have a little something that's different. Uh, same for exterior patio, try to have this, this one way uh, circulation, queuing, uh, transactions being important. And then maybe you do have plexiglass barriers, even on the exterior, so that when people are going by your table, you're not um, being exposed when, with your mask off. Uh, Mike, I'll lead off with you on this question, but uh, really- oh, yeah, I, I saw the question, yeah. Uh, for everyone. Well, I was gonna ask you as well, you know, we were talking this morning, everything's just been so slow as well. So as we're talking about uh, physical space uh, improvements, uh, there's still just a lot of places where, um, you know, even though you can have up to 50% in an office, uh, we're just not seeing that yet. And, uh, and I assume that you're seeing that throughout your buildings as well. Yes, I, you know, um, despite the fact that May 20th was the date that people could come back to their offices. We have not seen any dramatic change in the number of uh, tenants that are actually occupying their space or the number of employees that are, have come back. I think people generally are continuing to work remotely or not coming in. I think, you know, until people feel safe and comfortable and, and are willing to come back, I, I think it's gonna take some time, as Mark said. Uh, you know, this is, um, people are gonna have to uh, find a, a level of comfort and we can do as much as we can. Uh, enough can be communicated about how safe it is, but the reality is, is that until people truly feel safe, things will not dramatically change. Uh, you know, and I do agree with Karen. I mean, we've, we've also tried to create uh, circulation in the buildings one way in, one way out where we can or have different doors for in and out and then have uh, barriers between the in and the out um, traffic flow. Um, I mean, bathrooms are problematic. We've increased the level of cleaning in the bathrooms, uh, but the reality is you can't clean them um, constantly. And, and that is an issue. Uh, you know, obviously there's sanitizers in the bathroom, there's soaps in the bathrooms. Um, you know, I know that uh, we've talked about going to um, touchless uh, flushing systems, but that's not something you can do overnight and that's not an easy thing to do, but something that in the future, clearly we're going to move in that direction. Um, so um, uh, again, we have increased, we've added additional cleaning during the day to go into the bathrooms. We've added, uh, our cleaning staff uh, midday to do it. We have our own staff going in uh, from time to time during the day as well. But unfortunately, it's almost impossible to uh, clean after every use. And that's, that is an issue. But I do think that, you know, uh, we've gone a long way in terms of increasing the uh, level of cleanliness in the bathrooms. And, and again, we're asking our tenants if they wash their hands, before and wash their hands after, that's gonna reduce any risk there is with regard to uh, transmission. And we're also asking that our tenants pay attention, make sure that they know who has symptoms or not, have people stay home that have symptoms. We have to do everything to reduce the, the level of, of, of um, the infected individuals that come into the building. We're trying to control uh, guests that come in, we're asking that those be limited. We're asking that they tell us who's in and that we track. And we also are tracking when people come in to the building as well. So there are a lot of things to reduce the risk that someone is coming into the building that can transmit. And then clearly um, consistently uh, cleaning high touch surfaces. Uh, in, our, in the gold building downtown, we're gonna have the high touch surfaces uh, 
sanitized six times a day. Um, and we're returning the elevators to the, the, to the first floor and left in an open position so you don't have to call for them. So um, you know, we don't always have that in our buildings, but where we do, we're instituting that. So it is, you know, clearly it's an area we do think that it's been mitigated to a point where it's not a serious risk, but obviously people are, you know, again, everybody's anxious right now. And uh, until people feel a level of comfort and safety, um, you know, it's gonna be a while before everybody comes back to work. Uh, Mark, let me ask you this. Um, space is uh, a positive and a liability right now. Uh, if you have too much space and you're not going to be using it as much for uh, folks in your office, um, you know, that's an extra expense. But if you have a lot of room to be able to space people out, that's a positive as well. So Mark, uh, just as you look to with furniture and other types of options, um, how are you thinking about space? Well, when we look at space right now, it's very important. And, and if there was a time where the power of partnership was very prevalent, this is the time, right? This is very, very time. So if I had to frame this in three buckets, I would say one of the most important things is safety, right? And, and wellness, as, as you heard already. And, and, and with that, I think we need to ease the perception of fear uh, in people and create a level of comfort and at the same time, try to help establish and give them a level of autonomy, okay, and empowerment uh, in the workplace and sort of soften their workplace experience because that's gonna be very important as we move to open up spaces. And I would say the second uh, 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 bucket would be the technology. As mentioned, technology has always been an enabler to these type of environments. And as I think Karen mentioned or Mike, video conferencing, I mean, video conferencing has been around for over 20 years and we've been attempting to move in that direction and it has not been successful due to the human level of engagement that people really want. People want to travel, people want to get out there, right? So the technology enabler is very, very important from all aspects, from, uh, from VR, from AR, and uh, scheduling and booking, from, uh, from devices and laptops so people can gain uh, some certainty around what they can expect when they go to the building and also the technology enable and lining it with the functionality of the space. And I would say the, the third bucket is, is sort of the balance and bridging the gap in between the physical and the virtual, which is very, very key, the home and the remote work, right? I mean, we have been struggling with remote work and working from home for decades, right? And now we were forced into this experiment that tested the tide and tested the waters. And unless I'm wrong, it appears to come out positive, right? Productivity was up on people uh, working from home. People were happy. They would be able to get more balance in their life with their, their families and their kids. And, um, and, and, and it's been very interesting from that point. But lastly, the most important when we talk about the workplace is taking these three components and integrating them into a cohesive workplace experience that makes the most sense. And we wanna look at the, the, uh, our company's existing environments and see if we could reimagine and repurpose the experience that already exists. Because, I mean, there's been a lot of conversations in the industry around what should we do? Do we reconfigure? Do we turn places upside down? And those are a lot of great thoughts. But I think first, let's try to reimagine what we already have. Because if you think in terms of activity-based work, I don't think that that's going to change, right? So we can take the existing environments, have the conversations with our, our customers, understand their culture, understand the functionality, but also understand the people that are, or functions that are coming back uh, to the office, okay? Uh, as, and that's when I think we could start to have the solid discussions around repurposing and reimagining and creating those environments for uh, who's coming back to the office first over the next 60, 120, and the next year and, uh, and have that work. So it, it might be safe to say around your comment, increasing space, reducing space for the companies that were ahead of the game and, and, and people helping organizations be nimble with their space, they're probably in the best position right now. But I think uh, most uh, organizations uh, are gonna, and real estate groups are gonna pause right now and not jump the gun because I think it's been stated on many occasions that 
uh, we have short memories and things are going to at some point, but we don't know when. So I, I, I think the open environment that we created over the years is here to stay. And we just need to reimagine what that looks like and factor in the CDC guidelines, get the social distancing nailed and understand what that means and create that safe environment for the companies, their culture, their functionality, and uh, people coming back to the office. So. I appreciate it, Mark. And, and Don, I'll, I'll turn to you, kind of same question about use of space, but Mark just started to touch on it as well. We had moved to such a shared work environment, very open, and um, you know that doesn't seem like the kinds of terms we're talking about right now uh, as people think about uh, working, but, but how do you keep that opportunity open while still adjusting to the times right now? So I think, um, and, and Mark made a lot of these points, I think it's, um, it, it's going to definitely be in phases and, you know, clients are, are we don't believe clients are going to go out and get extra real estate to, you know, move people apart. We really think it's going to be in the, in the now and the near term, a balance of this working remotely and working within spaces um, and um, going through and doing the things um, that Karen was showing in terms of reducing the density um, and, you know, being able to, to give that pe people that space and the protocols and all of the things that go along with it. The other thing that I don't think we can emphasize enough is that, is that the human centered approach to that. Um, you know, within our own organization, I'm actually participating on the task force that's uh, creating our own reporting strategy for our 400 plus employees across New England. And um, we are surveying our leaders. We're doing workshops. We're surveying our employees. We're doing town hall meetings. We're telling everybody our virtual doors are open. So I think that, um, as Mark had said, it is, it is a great experiment in the future of work right now. We were all forced to immerse ourselves in a new way of working. Um, and that there's going to be um, demands on that going forward. I don't think people are going to want to return to, I'm going into the office to go to work. They're going to want to be able to have that balance and that choice and control. We used to talk about choice and control within the office environment. It's just going to continue to expand, um, you know, and as Mark said, I think as we move forward um, into the next, whether it's 60 days or 90 days or um, we, none of us really know, um, we are probably going to want to be bringing more people back as most organizations are, you know, keeping that remote strategy very strong right now. Um, and how do we need to do that by reconfiguring, rethinking spaces and that flexibility is key. Um, and one last point on the um, the open environment, it's kind of interesting. One of the concerns a lot of clients have right now are, is around conference rooms. We've heard customers say they're just going to close off conference rooms. Right. They're not going to allow people to even go in there, that they feel like um, being in a conference room is going to give people a lot of anxiety. So then you start looking at a lot of what was going on prior to this around the whole agile work process and things around stand-up meetings and meetings out in the open that are quick and productive and you could spread people out and leverage, you know, different types of technologies to connect folks that are in the office and, and remote. So I think that's going to be another big element of how we're going to move forward through this. That's interesting. Uh, Karen, there was a specific question to you about education and how uh, education spaces may change. I know I've talked to some of the universities and their process of going through all of their classrooms and looking to see what they can do as far as space and even how many people they can fit in them. Do you have any thoughts on uh, what the universities and even the local schools should be looking at? Well, we've been reading articles as much as we can from around the world about how pe people are, are thinking about these things. Uh, there are various different models. One is that you take in, I mean, take in, you uh, have as many people as you used to enrolled, but you divide a schedule 50-50. So if you have, if you normally had like a Tuesday, Thursday class, you can go to one or the other. You're, you're assigned to a Tuesday class and then you're listening in remotely onto the Thursday class. So that's one model. Um, there are so many different ways. We, we haven't really, um, we haven't heard anything locally about um, anything concrete locally but certainly that first model to me makes a lot of sense um you know i think everyone has uh relationships with people who just got into college but they don't know if they're going to be going uh, especially if it's a foreign college or even you know in canada one of those borders going to be opening uh yale when as well i mean any any university that has people um 
uh, for a lot of foreign students. So maybe it'll be sort of, uh, that'll be sort of a natural way of attrition where any of the four students, if they're not um, allowed to come in physically, they will be the, the group that is 100% remote. And then within the group that is local, you know, is there a division that way? But I think the, certainly the 50% is one way to look at it. And that sort of remains to be seen. I'm seeing yeah, and, and as you were talking, definitely gonna be some issues as far as flow, because a lot of those classrooms aren't set up uh, with multiple doorways in and that. Uh, Mike, let me uh, turn back to you a uh, question. Uh, or a point that you raised earlier was having a point person, and that's been really uh, significant for you in dealing with tenants, that each tenant has a point person that, that you're working with on a regular basis. Yeah, I, again, this is, uh, it's collaborative. If we're going to create safe work environments, it's not just what we do, it's what the tenants do and, and how we communicate. And this is a, a different level of communication than we've had historically. Um, and, you know, obviously they have control over their spaces. Some tenants have kitchens uh, that need to be attended to. Uh, they need to ensure that they take care of their own spaces carefully and that they also monitor their employees and who comes in, when they come in, uh, and under what uh, circumstances that they have visitors that come in. Again, it's, it's, it's the collective effort which is unique, not what we've historically done. But it's the only way that we're going to assure ourselves, our tenants, and, and employees that the environment is safe and that their health and well being is uh, being taken care of. I mean, we, you know, this is an important element. Uh, this is not obviously part of what was uh, uh, suggested by the state. This is something we picked up through a, a national webinar. And uh, honestly, it's been a very effective tool. Um, so uh, we think this is an important way of creating the type of partnership that has not historically been the partnership between landlord and tenant. You know, one of the things we're thinking about, we deal with, we work in New York and we've seen how they're functioning and obviously they have the shared office space, which is, a, which is seriously an issue now going forward. They also do enterprise um, leasing where they have short-term leases with large corporations. We think that you know, honestly, we're going to try this in some of our buildings where we'll have space that is uh, fully furnished um, and we'll do short term leases. I know you're trying to do it on, on shorter term leases and shared space uh, in the chamber. We, we would not do that. We would do, uh, you know, one suite that would be leased to uh, some tenant for a short term basis. Uh, do think that, you know, as people do thin out and they do want to have people operating, this is maybe one way they can do it on it on a short-term basis for a year or two. These would not be long-term leases and they would not come with TI money so that they would be easy and efficient to bring people in, obviously sanitize when somebody leaves. Uh, but we've also seen, Mark, interesting as you comment that we rent apartments. We have a number of apartment complexes as well as office space and we've gone virtual on all showing of apartments. We don't want to take people we don't know into our apartment buildings. We don't want them going into apartments that are habitated by others. So we have now uh, done all of our leasing remotely. Uh, we, we bought virtual cameras so we can do virtual tours. Uh, uh, we've created um, uh, a number of electronic brochures that we didn't have historically. We've gone um, and used um, social media outlets for advertising in ways uh, and promotion in ways we haven't in the past. Surprisingly, um, we are reading at the same level this year, even though Yale doesn't know what they're going to do so far in the fall. And Karen, it's still up in the air. I, they clearly are gonna come back. Everything that we know, what we've heard, they're coming back, how they're gonna handle it. Um, you know, uh, they're clearly going to try to reduce the the load in their classes and, and people will be doing this remotely. You know, I have a daughter who's in college and someone has, has asked me, what are you gonna do if they're remote learning? I said, she's gonna go back remotely because the alternatives, she sits in the house and she watches movies all day long and that's not a good solution either. So, you know, we've, we're all making adjustments in terms of this uh, and it's surprising how effective those adjustments have been. Um, you know, clearly we'd prefer to show people apartments, 
but we've also been able to do it in a way that it's been very effective. Um, so, um, you know, so it is about collaboration it is not only with our office tenants, but with our apartment tenants, we got to be careful. We got to be concerned about their well being. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Don, let me ask you this question because we're all or many of us working from home. Um, any, any thoughts on how people can arrange their home office, especially as we're going to be uh, in these situations for a while and they want to be effective, they want to have uh, uh, backgrounds that, uh, don't scare, that are, uh, you know, uh, pleasing. So uh, any thoughts on that? So um, that's, everybody kind of got a chuckle out of that because I think that that, you know, while working from home has, has worked in, in this short term, I think that that's something that's very definitely going to need to be addressed if it's, as it continues. Um, you know, there's lots of little ways that you could do some ergonomic adjustments. You know, uh, I've seen some things around, you know, even just putting, realistically just putting pillows behind your back, adjusting the, um, you know, adjusting the height of your monitor um, and those types of things. Um, and, and also the, the well-being component of getting up and moving. I don't know about the rest of you, but, um, you know, I find myself sitting in one place a lot more than I ever did before. So, you know, when you're on a conference call to get up and walk around and, you know, if I'm on a training call, I turn my camera off and God only knows what I'm doing so I can stay moving. So I think it's, it's um, I think that's a great point. And then the other thing that we think about is what are the things people are going to miss? What are the things people miss about being in the office and what are the things people are going to miss when they go back to work and kind of cherish those things that you have, you know, the dog barking in the background is not a problem on a call anymore. Everybody's getting kind of used to it. Um, so I, I think you're going to see that real blurring of lines between, between the home and the, and the work environment, but all those things that apply to good ergonomics in the office apply, apply at home. Um, unfortunately, we don't all have great setups and, and ability to do that, but we just have to be, uh, creative, I guess. <laughs> Good points. Uh, Mark, I'm going to ask you a last question, then we'll uh, have everyone give a, kind of a closing statement. But um, there was a question about touchless sinks uh, in the bathrooms. Um, we, we've talked a lot about uh, touch points, you know, but even in just the last couple of months, we've seen the shift from uh, the health professionals telling us, you know, yeah, definitely touching things is a concern, but it's more face-to-face -face contact. And I bring all of that up just to say that we're constantly learning more and more uh, about the virus and shifting what we think is the big concern point. And so that makes, as you plan your office out, uh, difficult as well. So what, what would you say about flexibility, I guess, as you put in the place these different measures? Well, you mentioned flexibility. And flexibility is very important, uh, very important, because that's one of the key enablers and elements that help set up the space to make it conducive to the current climate that we're in. And, uh, you know, ironically, if you go back to, or if you look at some of the ADA guidelines and the protocols that made it easier for individuals to access space, like automatic doors and buttons, you know, there's an outside chance that we may be able to look at some of those components and implement those to help solve for uh, certain cri criteria when it comes to that perspective. But the, the what we're really going to need to do is amp up the cleaning measures, uh, uh, make sure that the education around space, social distance, uh, protocol is, is really uh, given in a way for people to really understand how to act and how to operate and, uh, and the behavior around what the workspace will potentially look like and how we operate in it. So it's, it's not gonna be easy. Uh, it's gonna be difficult and it's gonna be uh, sort of a, a, a whole new concept of, the, of change management that we've been doing for many years in different forms and different cycles. And now change management is gonna have to be implemented and developed for the criteria that we're dealing with now. And that's gonna be very important as well as the change management protocols uh, distributed throughout organizations and, uh, and how we operate. So we're still focusing on the experience, right? Because that's really what it comes down to. How do we create that, that seamless experience that 
makes the most sense as it continues uh, to, to evolve. And, and you know, it, as, as we know, there's been a number of great conversations around what to do, how to do it, the ideation, the, the, the great thought leaders. And uh, I think as we heard on, on numerous occasions, we really don't know. And one of the best ways is to just continue to monitor and measure behavior of what we have implemented in certain circumstances and, and uh, react accordingly, okay? And make the best decisions that protect the interests of uh, everyone, our employees, the corporations, and, and everyone involved. And I say it again, I think the, the, the power of partnership is very prevalent at this time for, for us as providers, for us as organiz uh, for organizations and everyone involved in servicing uh, the customer base is to really come together, share ideas, and uh, make great recommendations and options to make sure we create the most positive, best experience uh, for everyone. Thank you, Mark. We really appreciate it. Uh, Karen, um, those were great slides you had just in showing how you actually do uh, these things. Any last, last words from you? Uh, I'd say let's not lose sight of our long-term goals as organizations, you know, collaboration, uh, working together. Uh, I think in this, in this uh, time, we have really learned how to uh, be more efficient with certain parts of our processes. Um, in our case, we always are thinking about uh, the most uh, efficient spaces. And for us, it means connection to nature, which is another thing that I think a lot of people have had more opportunity for. So healthy buildings, healthy people, healthy minds, um, you know, fresh air, uh, access to outdoors, uh, collaboration in a different way, whatever form it takes, but let's not lose sight of uh, those, those goals. Thank you. Stand up desks, it. stand up desks. I'm at my stand up desk now, it really helps. Oh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Karen, as always, we appreciate it. Uh, Don, uh, some last thoughts from you. So Karen, I actually improvised and I have a stand up bookcase behind me. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I had that before this one came. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> got to figure out what we can do to make it work, right? So um, I think that we, we're all echoing that um, people are not going to be returning to work environments that they don't feel safe in. And if you're forcing that, um, you're not going to get the best work out of, your, out of your people. So we need to really figure out how to, you know, fix these spaces in a way that doesn't take away from all those things that, that the environment brings to culture and to um, a company's identity and competitive advantage. And then I think Karen, as you mentioned around education, what a what a shocking time and a different time for people and how they're going to be learning and how uh, educational organizations need to pivot. And then if you look at healthcare organizations, what they're going through right now, what's life going to be like when they you know move away from post emergency services and the drain on their revenues um, and what they've had to deal with and and the you know the clinician burnout and you know, patient safety and well-being. So there's so much to be thought about in all of these different environments. Um, and I think, you know, again, that as everybody's echoed, that collaboration and communication are going to be key as we keep learning and learning from each other. Great. Thank you, Don. Really appreciate it. Great insights. And Mike, I'll, uh, I'll leave you with the last word here. Well, I, first off, this has been a great opportunity to uh, be on the panel with some remarkably talented and, and thoughtful individuals. And thank you for asking me to join this. Uh, this has been, I think, very illuminating. And you know, the consistency in some of the messaging from all of us, I think, has been uh, wonderful. I think we're all sort of um, experimenting with things to do, how to adjust, how to adapt under the circumstances that none of us ever expected to have to contend with. And it's been remarkable how successful we've all been. It's kind of a time of suspended animation. Uh, my kids are home, uh, one who works in New York and the other from college. So we're suspended in our emptiness is now refilled. Uh, and that's been wonderful. Um, we've all adjusted to life both in, in, in work and at, at home. And I think uh, it's an important thing. And it's also a time when we have to uh, take uh, little steps, step at a time, uh, continue to uh, move forward, think about tactics, think about things we can do to improve, and as we all are, and recognize that we have to be thoughtful about how the future will play out, but that there's so many uncertainties right now that uh, the most important thing is to 
to deal with tactics, deal with how we can make the environments more uh, comforting and safe and, and to create a sense of well-being a part, uh, on the part of all that we interact with. And the more we can do to make people feel comfortable, the quicker we're all going to get back. And I know there was the question about not-for-profits. There are a lot of businesses that are going to be very seriously impacted by this uh, uh, pandemic. The small businesses that are going to be uh, seriously impaired. I don't know how many are going to reopen at the end of this and how long this goes on, the harder it's going to be. I know that the Great Give uh, doubled the amount of money that people in this community gave to organizations. And it's heartwarming to see how, how many people are reaching out to help each other. Uh, again, this is a time that we all have to come together and work together and work in unison to make the world a better place. And, to make us function more effectively than we have been. So um, I appreciate being on this panel. It's been great to be a member of uh, this great panel of some very thoughtful people. And thank you for having me as part of this. No, definitely. Uh, thank you, Mike, and, and appreciate everyone uh, being a part of the panel. And you know, I, th I think uh, as all of our panelists have said, uh, one of the keys to all of this is just common sense and making sure that you're using um, common sense in how you set up things, because everyone's space is going to be different. There's not a, a one size fits all. And, and I appreciate you, Mike, addressing the question about nonprofits. You know, any business that has a lot of people coming in, um, you just have to use your, your best thoughts about how you keep some distance, how you uh, limit the amount of exposure of, of folks. So once again, thank you to our panel. Um, I want to thank our sponsor for today's webinar, Munger Construction, Pat Munger Construction, uh, definitely a source to turn to as you look at how to reconfigure your space. Also want to thank again, Connecticut Natural Gas, Southern Connecticut Gas and UI, the Avangrid family who has been supporting so many of our reopening programming. And just remind everyone, our healthcare and life science awards are going to be taking place on June 16th. So talking about doing things different, this is our first a uh, major virtual event, and we hope everyone will attend that. Registration is available on our website. We have a great panel and also great honorees, all related around COVID-19. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.